Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm actually probably as excited as uh, you are, or more so because I really admire the friends. Um, you have an asset that the state doesn't take enough pride in. The offshore islands, the coastal islands are just amazing. And what we have here is different than what the rest of the world has. And that's what we're probably going to go over. I've got a PowerPoint presentation. And so I'll just uh, see screen share. Oops. There we are. Okay, I trust everyone can see that all right. I'm not sure if I can get rid of the uh, screen at the top. I'm not sure where to, to eliminate that. I'm not sure what you can see. But anyway, let me start the presentation with this. And we're going to do a little time traveling just to set up the context of why it is that Maine is just so incredibly special and so different than really the entire rest of the uh, eastern part of the country and perhaps different than much of the world. So I'm going to start with this quiz question. What state is closest to Africa? Well, it all goes back 300 million years ago when all the continents collided because of plate tectonics. And you see the circle up there um, in the top. That's where Maine and Morocco join. Morocco is this big section all the way down to Washington, D.C. That was 300 million years ago. Then the continents started to separate. And it turns out that as it pulled away, Morocco is the closest to Maine. In fact, it is closest to uh, Quadi Head State Park in Lubeck. So that's why this happened. We now have an exceptionally rugged coast because if you have continents colliding and then pulling back apart, you can imagine that's really going to leave a jagged mess behind. And that's exactly why Maine's coast is the rugged rock-bound coast that it is. Not totally exactly, but compare that to the barrier islands. This is North Carolina's beaches. Uh, you go down, once you get out of New England, uh, you start to get down to uh, Assateague, Chincoteague in Virginia, uh, even the barrier islands of New Jersey and, uh, and Delaware. It's just sand beaches, barrier islands the whole way down. Nobody else along the East Coast has that kind of really rough coast that Maine does. And even in Maine, it doesn't really kick in until you get north of Portland. So let's see what else that means. Uh, Maine it has, uh, is number nine in the list of how much coastline there is. You might see it, say, from uh, Portland or from uh, Portsmouth to Lubeck, about 228 miles. That puts us number nine. But that's just airline miles. If you stretched out the coast, if you counted the uh, every inch, where the seawater hits the land, we actually bump right up to number four on this list. We're behind Alaska, Florida, Louis and Louisiana. Uh, they have a little more coastline than we do, but when you straighten it out, we've got 3,400 miles of um, area where the ocean hits the land. And uh, so that's a very significant chunk for a state that's really not as big as many of the states out west. So we got a lot of coastline and it's really rugged. So here's what you see. You see this, islands and rough coast all the way around. That's Maine. You don't see that much once you get further south of Maine. In fact, we have theoretically, according to some website statistics, about 3,100 uh, coastal, uh, 3, coastal islands. Alaska has maybe 2,600 named islands. You look at other stats and maybe Maine has fewer than Alaska. Alaska is a bigger whatever. Um, the Coastal Island Registry says maybe we have something like 3,000. The point is, a lot of those are barely islands. We have all kinds of ledges. We have a really rough ocean bottom here as well. And a lot of that reason is because of what the glaciers did to us. Not only did the continents colliding and separating leave us with a jagged mess, both um, horizontally and, and vertically into the ocean, but the glaciers then polished it off and added more. So 25,000 years ago, this is what the area looked like. We were under a mile to up to two miles of ice right here. And then what it did was in various successive ice ages, dumped a lot of material offshore as much as 360 miles offshore. So you see these big banks that isolate the Gulf of Maine, George's Bank being maybe the most famous. It was uh, famous for centuries as the incredible um, grounds for fishing and the Scotian Shelf. And there was this channel, the Northeast Channel, 
uh, where the Labrador current comes down. The Gulf Stream, which is the warm water, comes up from the uh, equator area, the equatorial regions, and goes over to Europe. And that's why London, which is the same latitude as Newfoundland, has about the same temperature and get as, uh, as areas much further south. The Gulf Stream does that. The Gulf Stream misses us. The Labrador Current comes down, seeps into this northeast channel between what was left behind by all the glaciers and makes our bay very cold. So not only do we have all these seabird islands, not only do we have that, but we have whales and other things coming in to feed in this ultra cold water. So Maine is really, really special. This is what it looked like 11,000 years ago. The glaciers receded. This is the Blueberry Barren in Columbia, Maine, Columbia Falls. And you can actually see where the ocean was. As the land rebounded, uh, the ocean level uh, fell about 200 feet or the land rose 200 feet. But you can still see exactly where the ocean was at one time on these Blueberry Barrens. Here's a Maine Ice Age trail there now that uh, shows you a lot of what there is to view about what the Ice Age did to the area. So we have all the plate tectonics and then we have the glaciers and that's why Maine is rugged and has all these great opportunities to see seabirds. I will give you the bad news. Um, we are now the fastest warming body on earth. So anyone who is suspect about whether climate change is real, take a look. This is what uh, the red area indicates what is heating up faster than normal. And Maine, the Gulf of Maine is one of those bodies. And you can already see some of the changes in what the sea life is doing. Uh, the whales are moving around, coming in a little bit less or in different places than they used to be. Uh, some of the seabird colonies are having a little struggle now and then because of uh, they can't uh, do as well with the warm water fish that have seeped in. And uh, you know, now we get great white shark stories in Southern Maine, especially. So all this is going on out there in our ocean. Now, let's take an inventory of the birds I'm going to be talking about. We have a lot of sea ducks that mostly come down from Canada. And I'll start with the common otters. They breed here. They also come down from Hudson Bay. So we normally have a lot of common otters. I will tell you this winter is an odd winter. The sea ducks numbers are just way down. Um, and I've talked it over within the fisheries and wildlife and the game bird biologists, and it's not entirely clear What's going on? Avian flu affected some colonies of eiders in uh, Canada. We know that. Uh, there may be food problems because of the Gulf warming up. We don't really know. This may be just a one-year aberration, but the eiders and scoter numbers are just way down this year. This is what you can find in some places in Maine in a normal year. In fact, um, you can still find this particular photo at, uh, at reversing falls in Sullivan right now. They're still Oh, roughly 400 eiders crammed into the falls right there, which makes a great photo. So besides the common eider, one of the holy grail birds is the king eider. We get one, two, maybe three sightings a year in Maine, but it's such a pretty bird. We always look for it. Uh, so the king eider is a possibility in Maine. It, uh, because the eider numbers are so low, I haven't really heard of any much uh, this year. But that's a holy grail bird we're always looking for. Scoters, we have three of them. We have uh, black scoter, white winged scoter, which is on the left, and then on the right, there is the surf scoter. So black scoters, uh, we get all three species here. They can mingle, they can be in the same flock, but they don't all come from the same area. So when you're wondering, okay, what is populating the Gulf of Maine this time of year and where are they coming from? It's actually rather widespread. Black scoters tend to be towards the east. Surf scoters, which is this guy right here with the white cap, uh, white back of the neck, really has spread well throughout the entire northern part of uh, Canada. So from east to west, right out over all the way to Alaska. White wing scoters are, for the most part, birds of the west. For whatever reason, they've evolved to fly to the east coast and spend a lot of their winters over here with us. Uh, and they're not the only ones that do it. Bohemian waxwings and a few other species probably following what the Ice Age left behind you know, centuries ago. Uh, they probably follow a migration path that they used to follow when there was still uh, the Ice Age uh, retreating. So they're coming from the West over to visit us here and spending the winter along the main coast all the way down to Florida. Grebes, we have two species. They both nest up in the subarctic. Uh, redneck grebes are around. And then horn grebes are Pretty plentiful. You'll see these guys in the ocean quite a bit just about anywhere you go. 
loons. We have common loons, which is the one up in the top left. On the right is a red-throated loon. We've got a bunch of those. And then we have a Pacific loon, which is kind of a rarity, but several do show up every year. There's one in Waldo County right now that's been attracting a lot of attention. So they do get into Maine, but that's primarily a West Coast bird that wanders. Mergansers, we have three species. The one on the left is the one that is most prevalent in saltwater. That's the red-breasted merganser. It nests further north and winters off our coast, but not that much further north. I've seen uh, families with babies uh, on Grand Madan before. So, and uh, they just found, I think, uh, a, a breeding bird in uh, Maine during the winter atlas or the, the uh, summer atlas survey uh, in a, a remote area of Western Maine. So those birds um, are not all that far away when they migrate into Maine. And then the common merganser on the left, on the right rather, and the hooded merganser down below. Uh, those are the three mergansers we have. And you can find all three in salt water, but it's a red-breasted that tends to be there. Long-tailed ducks. These guys come down from the subarctic as well. Uh, a lot of these ducks migrate at night. I was shocked the other night. I was out uh, listening for owls and looking. And in the dead of night, I heard a long-tailed duck calling in the woods. I was not near the ocean. I did not really realize just how much they migrate at night. And I heard one flying over while it was nowhere near the ocean. So they're starting to move around right now. Buffleheads, real cute. They're uh, freshwater breeders and they'll hit all the freshwater as they go north. Right now, there's still a lot in the ocean, so you can still go out and find them. Golden eyes are freshwater nesters that will spend some time in salt water in the winter. The common golden eyes, very much so. You see a, quite a few of those. On the right is the Barrow's golden eye. Uh, they're much less common in the east, but we do get a handful of them along the coast here. Harlequin ducks. Didn't used to have all that many, but those numbers are actually building. We used to go out to Isla Ho to see them on boats, um, and that was like 30 years ago. These days, they're becoming very numerous along the southern main coast, and uh, I usually get flocks of them off um, Scudic Point in Acadia National Park and uh, other places, which we will talk about a little bit later. Purple sandpipers, the northernmost sandpiper in the world. These guys are Arctic breeders. They just can't be any further north because it's totally frozen. But in summer, they are the farthest north, and we get as much as half of the world's wintering population in Maine along our rocks. <clears throat> uh, so now I'm going to tell you everything about uh, good places to go along the Maine coast uh, where you can go look for these seabirds. Uh, if you're tempted to take notes, don't bother. I created the main birding trail so people could find their way around the state and find these good birding opportunities. And if you just go to mainbirdingtrail.com and go to the trails, you can look up areas and find all these same hot spots that I'm going to be talking about. So no need to take notes. You can go find all the information you want right there. So mainbirdingtrail.com. So let's go down right to the southern area of Maine and the southern Maine coast. And I think we'll start right with the Nubble which is uh, Sohir Park in uh, Cape Nettick in York. Uh, this island is just off the shoreline, and boy, the wintering sea ducks collect around this in big numbers. Uh, so you can find just about everything I talked about right there. Get up the coast a little bit. This is a cliff house in Agunquit. It's really in, in York, but it's uh, just on the York side of the border of Agunquit. Uh, and that's this big complex that still is, uh, that has been aware for a long time that birders like the area. So they're pretty friendly to birders and having people walk down along their shoreline, so long as you respect their their rules and their, their guests. And uh, But they encourage people, I think, to enjoy what they have to offer. It sticks out into the ocean, and it's a good place to see a lot of the birds we talked about. I think the best place to go birding in uh, southern Maine and really along the entire Maine coast is Marginal Way. It's a mile long path that goes out of Perkins Cove at Agunquit and goes uh, northward about a mile into uh, Agunquit Harbor or beach itself. So this walk has all these birds in huge numbers. So I shot this one just off the rocks there. This is a mix of black scoters and common eiders. They concentrate in numbers that big in that spot. And because it's a paved, easily walkable path that tends to lose its ice in winter, it is just the best place to go all in, in all of winter. I recommend that highly. If you go one place, that's the one. Wells Harbor is kind of interesting too because uh, the, it's got a channel 
and uh, breakwater. And because the water is sloshing back and forth into this harbor and out again, it just stirs up a lot of food and the ducks will sometimes collect in there. So I always make a stop at Wells Harbor. So in Lower York County, those are some of the places I would recommend. You get up a little further, uh, Bitterford Pool, still in York County, right there at the bottom of the map, and then up to Pine Points and uh, in Scarborough and then over to Cape Elizabeth or Kettle Cove and Two Lights. We'll get into those places, but here's Bitterford Pool. This is a, I, I never spend enough time here. I, it's always like a list of three or four places I'm gonna stop during the day. And I always don't save enough time for Bitterford Pool because it's a big place with a lot of interesting locations. The pool itself has sea ducks at high tide and then it empties out. You can see the channel at low tide. So it's mostly a mud flat good for shorebirds in the fall. The Bay Area at the lower end of the screen is good for sea ducks. A lot of the best places to watch these sea ducks tend to be those half moon beaches that uh, are sh that have a southern exposure. If uh, The prevailing winds uh, use those southern exposures to make the beaches. That's why you don't see them much beyond uh, mid coast Maine. Then uh, then the on the right side of the uh, screen, you'll see a couple of places that I'll describe here. So there's East Point Sanctuary, which is an Audubon sanctuary. And that one is a fun walk because it projects out into the ocean a little bit. And you can find an awful lot of interesting ducks, many of the ones I mentioned, uh, right along this really easy to walk path right along the ocean's edge. So Bitterford Pool is a great place to go try so your luck on some of these birds. You get up to Pine Point, Scarborough Marsh area. This one is, I always laugh at this one because it is so good at the bottom end of the screen, another one of those half moon beaches, the Scarborough Beach or really Pine Point Beach. And then the northern part is the actual working harbor and a big channel that goes off the screen to the right. That water also comes in and out. That means a lot of surging seafood uh, for the waterfowl and the seals will come in there as well. And uh, at the higher tides, you'll find a lot of these sea ducks in fairly close, right next to you, in fact. And then Pine Point Beach, as I say, is that half moon beach, which usually has some waterfowl right off the shoreline. And then that jetty, right where the breakwater that is located, um, the, where the tide comes in and out. Uh, a lot of wintering um, shorebirds will tend to sit on that, purple sandpipers or even sanderlings, which will use that beach, will sit on there at high tide. So I never overlook that one when I go there. So you can actually see clusters of Dunlin in late fall and sanderlings in midwinter uh, sitting right on that jetty if you bother to go look. We get up a little bit to the northern part, Kettle Cove, which is uh, next to a Crescent Beach State Park in uh, Scarborough. And that's got a lot of interesting places too. The northern part of the uh, screen, that's another one of those half moon beaches. You get over to the right side of that cove and there are a couple of places that are famous for being able to see ducks fairly easy. Then you get over to the right side and you get off to Cape Elizabeth into an area called Two Lights or Dyer Point. Uh, that's got some great rocky areas and maybe one of the best seafood restaurants in summer there is, if you don't mind waiting in line for a good meal. Uh, Portland, I'll just mention Back Cove is a good place to go look and uh, Eastern Promenade, uh, which goes on the eastern side of Portland along the water. That's a good place to look for some of these seabirds. You get up into the Freeport area, South Freeport Landing, I always point out, I visit when I get the chance, because Eiders and birds that really don't want to get tossed around by the sea really like it in there. There's a lot of food for them. So I will find a lot of common eiders flocked up in there. And also the uh, golden eyes really seem to like to go in there. Now, this is one of those photos which I think is special because how often can I get a common um, golden eye and a uh, barrow's golden eye side by side? But you'll notice the difference in the sloped forehead. Uh, the barrow's golden eye on the right has a much steeper forehead than the uh, female common golden eye to the left. Um, two of the best places to go seabird watching in Maine, with some offshore coastal islands, by the way, is Popham Beach and Reed State Park Beach. Uh, so Popham Beach State Park, the, the two are close together. They're uh, you know, on basically opposite sides of the, about the Kennebec River, but they couldn't be more different. Popham Beach is this long, gradual slope. At high tide, you can actually walk out to some of the close islands. Uh, just make sure you get off fast because the tide really rushes in there but it's this big, broad area. Get over to Reed State Park with this incredible view. 
and it slopes off very fast into the ocean. The advantage of that is that some of the sea ducks will gather in pretty close to the surf area, right next to the beach. Uh, you don't need a spotting scope. You could often just walk there and see a lot of these same ducks we're talking about right along the ocean edge. Uh, so Reed State Park is one of those areas I try to get to at least once a winter, sometimes more. <clears throat> and again, uh, you can see it right here, just how much the beach slopes very fast down into the water. So at any time, uh, you'll find that uh, it's fairly easy duck watching there. Oops. <clears throat> uh, Rockland, I was uh, take a moment to get to Rockland. I think maybe the jetty uh, that goes out to the lighthouse uh, leaves next to the Samoset uh, Golf Resort area. That's if, if it's good weather, if it's not windy, if it's not icy, that is probably a premier place to go try your luck for seabirds because they'll often get right close to the jetty there on the way out. Uh, and it's a nice, it's, God, it's almost a mile walk, I think, out to that lighthouse. Uh, a lot of people do it for fun, but birders will do it regularly. You will find those purple sandpipers along there. You'll find many of the uh, scoters and eiders uh, and a lot of the dabbling ducks right next to that pier, that jetty. Owl's Head Lighthouse, I'll mention. Uh, I get over there when I get the chance because there's some beach area there that has some good birds too. Belfast Harbor is good. It used to be better. I think now that they closed the canneries, uh, it's not quite as productive as it once was, but I usually find some good sea, uh, sea ducks in the harbor itself. Sears Island is becoming more and more popular with people. That's further up the coast as you get up towards uh, Sears Port and Stockton Springs. It's halfway between the two. A little further north of that. Oops, let me back up one here. Fort Point State Park over here uh, is also another good place to try your luck. Uh, you can walk down uh, close to the ocean in a couple parts of the park and get a good look, but mostly you're up a little high, so I will, don't get there every year. Now you're up around Mount Desert Island, and of course, if you do Acadia National Park and make the rounds, you can do the whole thing in one day, but it's going to be a long day. Uh, now that we have long days and the sun is staying up longer and the sea ducks mostly haven't left yet, this is actually a good opportunity to give Mount Desert Island a try. But just to give you some idea, going from uh, Thompson Island over there on the left, uh, at high tide, a lot of sea ducks could be in there. Uh, at high tide, over at Hulls Cove, as you're going to Bar Harbor, you can find some sea ducks in there. Bar Harbor Harbor itself often has uh, black yellowots, uh, which is a puffin-related species, uh, sitting there. Old uh, long-tailed ducks tend to be in the harbor. Common eiders tend to be there. So I will actually go into Bar Harbor Harbor and stand there and pier and see what kind of ducks uh, the surf will bring me. Then, of course, the classic place to go is all along uh, the, the most popular area of Schooner Head Road. It's the only area of the park that's plowed in winter. So you can actually get down as far as uh, Thunder Hole. You can get on a sand beach. And a lot of the sea ducks we're talking about can be along that stretch. Easy to see because the road is open right along the ocean edge. You can go to Thunder Hole and often see some of these species, black scoter in particular, really like to get in there. I usually find a good set of grebes. It's a great place to look for purple sandpipers. So that part of Acadia National Park can be just really good. Um, I like to get over to Northeast Harbor, check out the harbor at higher tide. Some of the ducks can be in very close. And then the Sergeant Drive um, along that, uh, that, that road there uh, can be kind of productive. I always peek into it. Then over on the quiet side of the island, uh, Southwest Harbor, I will go right out of the pier, the commercial town pier, and see what's in there. It's usually full of long, I mean, really full of long-tailed ducks. Red-breasted mergansers like to get in there. You'll find some scoter species in there and a lot of those same black guillemots I talked about before. Plus, a lot of dabbling ducks and the golden eyes like to be in that harbor too. So Southwest Harbor tends to be pretty predictably good. And then uh, you go along the shoreline and down to Seawall and Mansett and the picnic area just beyond Seawall. That area is, again, probably an area I will not miss if I go to Acadia National Park because it's exceptionally good. The purple sandpipers like to be on seawall. Uh, all three scoters are likely to be right off seawall, not far offshore at all. Uh, the red-breasted mergansers will be there. The long-tailed ducks will be there in good numbers. That's a really productive area, so... Make a mental note that if you want to look for these seabirds, Seawall and Manson is a particularly good place to go. Bass Harbor Head Lighthouse is good at any time, and I always look into the harbor at high tide at Bass Harbor to see what's there, because 
the long-tailed ducks and loons and things like that sneak in there. But this is what you're looking at when you get into the seawall and mantid. You've got this nice, beautiful, rugged coast left behind from when we broke off in Morocco. And the sea ducks can get in really close right there because the water gets deep fairly fast. And of course, the classic lighthouse that's in Bass Harbor too. Scudic Point, I'll do that several times a winter, starting at Fraser Point and just working my way around the loop road. You can only go one way past your, uh, Fraser Point. And all the lookout places uh, until you get right down to Scudic Point itself can be good for looking for these same sea ducks. It usually is very productive. Uh, once you get into the cove itself, Airy Cove, right at the southern end, look in that at high tide. You can find a lot of the uh, scoter species in there as, as possibilities, usually black scoters, but others as well. Get around to Blueberry Hill on the eastern side of the tip, and that uh, that is just usually full of birds as well. I find it one of the best places to see great cormorants, which I haven't mentioned, but they're always there. So Scudic Point is a place I would recommend. And uh, Sandy and I, my wife is on watching tonight, we often use uh, lead a trip over there every winter just because it's that good. And purple sandpipers, we can usually find them over there. And then you're rewarded with this incredible view from Scudic Point. Uh, so don't miss the opportunity to go there sometime in the winter. And I'll repeat, uh, most of the ducks are still here and still easy. And with the longer days and the warmer days, it's getting just easier and easier to see them at just about any of these places. Uh, some of these ducks won't leave until Memorial Day because the places they're going to go are still frozen late into the year. So you've got time. And if you get the energy, go do it. Prospect Harbor, uh, when the cannery was open, it used to be fuller of birds. Uh, lately, it's not been so good, but I always check it anyway. There's a couple of places over in Korea that have the harlequin ducks that I mentioned earlier. Um, it's worth a look if you know where to go, but I'm not sure it's worth recommending to you right now. <clears throat> I'd like to get up to Petit Manan, which, of course, is the National Wildlife Refuge, refuge with the uh, Petit Manan uh, offshore of the island. But uh, Hollingworth Trail leading down to the waterfront can be a lot of fun. I do that in late winter after the snow is cleared. But just uh, Pigeon Hill Road as you're getting up to the refuge is a good place to look for a lot of these same waterfowl because a lot of these ducks don't necessarily want to be storm tossed by a, a, a rough ocean. So they will get into these coves and these bays, making it easy for you to see them. And that happens to be one of those spots where they could be good. Rope Bluffs area. There's like three different places I always check, and probably the best place is right along the state park beach. The birds like to come in fairly close there, and usually uh, the sun is at a good angle. You can see them a little better. There's a road called Johnson Cove Road just before you get to that beach, uh, which crosses a bridge. That area can be very productive at higher tides. Shoppy Point right at the end, if you go by the park, it ends at a boat launch area. And I often find a lot of the scoters uh, in fairly close in there in the long-tailed ducks. <clears throat> you get up to Cutler, I think Little Machias Bay as you're going Route 191, uh, Scenic Coastal Highway. Uh, that can be productive. And Cutler Harbor itself, I usually take a peek into because some of these birds can stick themselves right in there. Maybe one of my favorite places to go in the entire state, and I did it this last week, is uh, the Lubeck area, Cobscook Bay. Uh, there are so many different places to go. I would start with Quaddy Head State Park because at, uh, especially when the tide is surging, mid-tide, uh, either falling or rising, um, a lot of the birds will congregate fairly close to the rocks right offshore and feed there in that surf. Uh, otherwise, they tend to be down on the South Lubeck sand flats, uh, again, where they're kind of sheltered uh, in good years, and this isn't one of them, there can be hundreds and hundreds of eiders and scoters in there. So that's worth a look. You can get another peek into it from the north on Maori Beach, right close to the edge of town. And I'll point out Johnson Cove. There's a historical society there where you can look into Johnson Bay. And uh, we, my wife and I call that Scoter Hole because usually you can find them and sometimes you can find them pretty close. So those are the areas I would recommend. And I will leave you with this part. And before we get to Q&A, which is the part I'm really looking forward to, I will mention that uh, you can find a lot of the same thing on YouTube now. Uh, thanks to COVID, uh, there was a period of time where a lot of virtual content was in demand from a lot of organizations like the Friends and Land Trust and Audubon. So I started just doing the same kind of presentations by YouTube so that people could actually see what I'm talking about. So you will find uh, on that channel 
um, a lot of video uh, video of the same places I'm talking about uh, and a lot, of, a lot of other entertaining content as well. And all you have to do is go to YouTube, enter Bob Duchesne, and I'm going to pop up and you can choose what you want to watch. But all of that is available to you, both online and uh, uh, on the main birdingtrail.com if you want to look it up that way. And with that, I will stop screen sharing and take it from there with Q&A. And Great, so thanks, far, Bob. Okay. I just, uh, yeah. And so I don't know if Tor Tori, are you uh, moderating Q and A? I'm happy to jump in if we need to. And I think if folks have questions, definitely drop it in the chat mm -hmm. um, instead of having everyone try to jump off mute all at the same time. Um, but thank you for that presentation. I'll start with that. Um, that was very. I love the the full breadth of the coast. So wherever yes. you live, <laughs> wherever you live, there's seabirds. Yeah. We just have so much to offer. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not seeing yeah, any questions come in yeah, yet. You but, can uh, put the questions in the chat, and if uh, yeah. unmuting and, and going live on the, on camera works, I'm okay with that too. Okay, great. I could ask a, a pretty basic uh, question, but when did you get into birding? No, oh, how, yeah. How long have you been birding? That's what I always get asked. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was kind of blessed, I guess. I was in first grade, and um, I was my father was teaching high school history in Gorham, New Hampshire at the time, and I was just able to see over the windowsill, and one morning, all these goldfinches came out of the grass, and you can imagine the grass is really green, and this flock of yellow birds is out there, and I just gawked at this. I was so impressed, and my mother, who's now 93, still remembers that day as well, so that was the spark for me. I had other sparks along the way, um, but that I just remember that so vividly. And this was now a very, very long time ago. But goldfinches did it to me in first grade. Any Still other looking... questions from folks? I'm happy to keep asking questions, but <laughs> oh, by all means, please do. <laughs> all right, we got one. Do you think some birds will be able to adapt better to global warming? And if so, any reasons why? Yeah, and the challenges to uh, adaptation are, are huge uh, because birds are just very specialized for niches. That's why there are so many species and why we have such a variety of species is each one has very peculiar habitat needs. Uh, and there are you can already see the change. I think my canary in the coal mine is boreal chickadee. That's the brown cap chickadee that's in northern Maine, like spruce fir forest. It's boreal because that's called, uh, you know, boreal was Latin for northern. So this chickadee species used to be down as far as Stonington. I could find it regularly. Uh, I've even had it on a vinyl haven one time. So they got down that far in just 10 years. I can't get them anywhere along the coast all the way up to the Canadian border. They have disappeared that fast. And it's not that the trees changed, they still like the spruce fir, but something happened to the food chain. Uh, I think the, the warmer winters uh, keep their food from being quite as prevalent as it was and they've just melted away from the coast completely. Um, a lot of birds are gonna have a challenge right now with rising sea level. We have um, a, 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 a sparrow, a salt marsh sparrow in uh, Scarborough Marsh that is dependent on the wet grasses that are available in that marsh to nest in, but it's getting drowned out with the rising sea level and that habitat is gonna get disappeared. It's now just going on the endangered species list in Maine and it's a candidate for disappearing very soon because climate change is happening that fast. Uh, food supply is gonna vary a lot. We're seeing the puffins on the offshore islands having challenging years feeding their young because they can't feed those uh, warm water uh, fish that come in. Uh, they're too big or the wrong shape for the chicks who have adapted to eating herring and sand lance and that kind of thing. Um, some of these birds are not going to make it. Some of these birds are going to recede north. You're already seeing a lot of southern Maine, uh, southern uh, American birds moving into New England and up into Maine. There's at least maybe a dozen different species in Maine now that weren't here 30 years ago, 20 years ago. I'm expecting several more to move into the states. Uh, turkey vulture is going to become a a state bird in winter uh, very soon. It's already in New Hampshire over winter. It's doing it here now in Portland. 
So we're seeing all these changes happen in real time right now. And a lot of these birds are not going to adapt to it. They will disappear, maybe replaced by others, uh, maybe disappear altogether. I know we had had a question come in um, prior to the talk about uh, the potential impact of wind turbines um, mm -hmm. in the ocean on seabirds, if you want to speak to that. Yes, very much so. Um, it is something that uh, concerns, I think, biologists, and the University of Maine has done some studies on it. Um, and there's a lot of history uh, of other wind power out in the, uh, the North Sea, for instance, over in Europe. So we have some idea whether the larger waterfowl in birds can can avoid problems. And I think there's some indication they can, they can see the trouble. And, but there's a stream of migrants that uh, come down the coast of Nova Scotia, uh, Nova Scotia and jump across the Gulf of Maine to get to the Maine uh, coast in order to continue their journey south. It turns out there's a bigger river of birds than I think most people realized. And when I say river of birds, I mean the migrants are just streaming across and ending up in places like Monhegan and Matinic Island and some of our main coastal islands uh, before they continue their journey south. I don't know if it's really clear how they're going to do, especially since they're nocturnal migrants uh, avoiding some of these wind turbines. So I think it is a concern. I think biologists are aware of it, uh, and I don't know how that's going to shake out. Looks like there's another question in the chat oh. asking if climate change will promote hybridization of seabirds. Or bird species in general. I, yeah, I, um, hybridization already happens. Generally, when you have two birds colliding at the edges, <clears throat> that happens. I think what's going to happen is you'll start to see those edges move because uh, as birds have to change their range because of changing climatic conditions, you may see more birds bumping up to each other. Uh, so I certainly would not rule that out. Uh, hybridization is not terribly common, but it does happen. And uh, I, I, it always has happened, but I think it will continue to do so maybe at an accelerated pace. There's another question here asking about if there's any birding groups to join. And before you answer, because I'm sure you have a lot, I'm just going to plug that we do host um bird walks in the spring and fall uh locally if you live around rockland that's something to keep an eye out for we'll be jumping into our spring bird walks at the end of april so the um, announcements for that will be out soon so keep an eye on that if you're someone who liked this talk and lives in the rockland area we do a number of walks in this area so keep an eye out for that and then i'll let you answer if you have any other groups yes the obvious answer is maine audubon not only does the state organization lead its own walks, but uh, we're lucky to have chapters all along the coast from uh, Mary Meeting, uh, just north of Portland, uh, the Mid Coast chapter, I think, which is probably more prevalent in your area. Uh, and then you get up to the Down East area, uh, Down East uh, Audubon, which is the Blue Hill to Acadia National Park area. Inland, the Penobscot Valley chapter is very active. There is a Fundy chapter up in the northern part of the uh, Copscook Bay area. So all these chapters do their own local walks as well. Uh, they all have their own schedules. And if you're a member of uh, Maine Audubon in any of these catchment areas, you're automatically assigned to that chapter. You'll get the newsletter and you'll, you'll see when the walks are. Um, so you have that option. One thing I'll recommend, we have three birding festivals along the coast, visiting some of your offshore islands too. Uh, Petit Manan in particular tends to be very popular. Uh, one of them goes out to um, Seal Island uh, off uh, Stonington, you know, we go out of there. And these festivals are really good opportunities for people who are just really beginners to intermediates. Experts like to come too because we go to cool places, but it's really a good place to go through, through some organized activities for an entire weekend and experience a lot of this in a hurry and learn a lot too from uh, all the guides they bring in to help lead. Uh, so there's one in Deer Isle, Stonington, the third weekend of May, uh, and that's uh, the Wings Waves Woods Festival, which you can find online or on the Maine Birding Trail website. Uh, the Down East Spring Birding Festival is always Memorial Day weekend up in the Lubeck area. And then in Acadia National Park, it's the Acadia Birding Festival. And that one's pretty big. And registration for that goes on uh, sale April 1st. So you have those opportunities as well. A lot of local land trusts will organize bird walks, bringing in a local expert to do something. 
So there's actually quite a few opportunities to go out with somebody and uh, use their guiding services. Question, what is in Belfast Bay, I think just popped up. Um, again, I have not really taken a good look at Belfast. I, I was going to do that this morning and then ran out of time. <laughs> Um, I think it's probably having the same experience that uh, the rest of the coast is. Some of the sea ducks just are not numerous this year at all in the way they normally should be. But uh, I know somewhere down there, there's that uh, Pacific Loon off in Waldo County somewhere. I think it's in that area. Uh, so that would be the exciting part. I, and I think the waterfowl right near the, uh, the walking bridge uh, is still pretty good this year. I'm seeing a lot of eBird reports on just the ducks that collect in there, the mallards and things. I want to make sure you see the, the question that um, if you could interview one bird, what type would it be? And <laughs> what would you ask them? Um, this is a new thing for me. Um, I have, I, I guess I'll give credit to COVID again, and COVID deserves credit for a few things. One of which is a confinement in my backyard more than ever for a period of time. And I really, really got to know my own birds, the chickadees that were coming to my feeder, my nuthatches, blue jays, morning doves, you name it, uh, the woodpeckers. And I began to really realize that as much as I'm watching birds, they're watching me. And they're doing it just as much. I'm as much a part of their world as they are a part of mine. And now it's pretty much a family group. I'll go out there, I'll talk to them, they'll talk to me. <laughs> uh, I think it's possible to get them to eat out of my hand if I want to try hard enough. I haven't yet, but um, there's that kind of interaction that is now available to me. And now wherever I go, I I almost treat it as a conversation with animals. And I will actually, you know, I've been out in areas where there are bears but doing surveys. I will talk to the bears. I will talk to the moose. Um, I will do everything it looks uh, uh, to avoid. Uh, I'll, I'll try to avoid looking like a threat, like a problem, just so that we can be comfortable with each other. They're, they're quite familiar with what I am as a human, um, and I'm now very comfortable with who they are. So nowadays, I'm just part of nature. I'm not just watching nature. I'm in it when I go out, and I recommend that experience to everybody. So you can watch how do they behave around you. Getting to the interview part, spruce grouse, my favorite bird by far, because they each one have a different personality. And I can say that because males go back to the same spot every spring. They have a favorite spot that they use as their mating territory to draw in as many potential mates as possible. And if you know where that spot is, you can go visit them every year. And once you get to know these birds, you realize some are bolder than others. Some are a little bit shy. Some are apt to fly to the top of the tree. Some will walk down around your feet and not care. So these individual birds have individual personalities just like humans do. And never was that more clear than what I get with these spruce grouse. So I just absolutely love that bird. I just want to highlight um, Eddie Edwards, who works for the Main Coast Islands Refuge, yes. just shared in the chat, said, hey, everyone, I'm jumping in late, but spent the day out on Matanicus Rock and happy to report that the razor bills are starting to stage offshore as they get ready for the nesting season. I estimated approximately 60 birds, but the number should grow to 400 in the next few weeks. Hmm. Hey, uh, hey um, you can reply in the chat or jump online if you want, but I'm, I've lost track of what, whether common murs are nesting out there at all. Um, I think they were trying for a while. Um, and what was it? Oh, um, the shearwater too. I, I know that uh, one of the shearwaters was trying to nest out there in recent years. So if you have any interest, any, uh, and great cormorants, I've always, they're all over um, Seal Island. I always wondered if they're out there. So Eddie, what's the story and what you got out there? Yeah, so what, I don't care if you can hear me okay, but um, yep. so as far as Mink Shearwater, it's the only uh, population in the U.S. And I think uh, last year, don't hold me to it, but I think there was like eight pair um, out on Matinicus Rock. And uh that's here. The other question you had was a great cormorants. They'll hang out down mm. the uh, on the one end, but um, they're usually non-breeders. We don't have any nesting colonies established on that particular yeah. island. Seal Island or um, Brimstone Islands, another right. one, little Brimstone, we get them. So um, 
that's that's the update. Uh, <laughs> what was the, the third question you had for me? Um, oh, come and Murr. Oh, yeah, so for, for the first time, oh, well, this is about four years ago now. For the first time in about 130 years, we actually had common MERS get reestablished on Matinicus mm -hmm. Rock. They've been absent for about, yeah, like I said, 130 years. And uh, I don't know how many um, MERS nested last year. I don't have that memorized, but mm. I would I would bet there was, you know, close to a dozen nests, dozen or you know, maybe 20. Um, the one thing about MERS is it takes forever for them to recolonize an area. And it's like they're waiting for that first one to get out on the island and, and set up camp. <laughs> and then as soon as that, then there's kind of like a mad rush and they're all they're all going in and nesting um, in the colony. So uh, we expect that number to continue to grow on Matanicus mm -hmm. Rock. Well, that's good. See, now everybody has learned something tonight, including me. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you very much. Because uh, yeah. I've, I've been telling everybody that I know of that a great cormorant range of nesting goes down to about Seal Island, but I was never too sure about uh, um, uh, out there on, on either of those islands. So um, thanks for clarifying. There is a question asking, has avian flu affected migrating seabirds in Maine? Um, I understand it has been a uh, it has uh, hurt the colonies of uh, common eiders up in Canada, uh, and that could explain why we're seeing a lot fewer of them this year. Um, I've not really heard too much problem in Maine waters. Uh, there probably is some effect, but I'm not hearing that. Um, and as you saw with the Scoter maps, those birds tend to be well distributed further north, um, out of range perhaps of some of the avian flu. Uh, they only come here in the winter, so. I think it's possible those are okay. Um, so I think the eiders is the one that we probably worry about. And they were already hurting anyway because their food supply of mussels is dwindling because of green crab and some parasites. So eiders is gonna be a challenge for a while. Well, if there are no more questions, sooner or later, people are going to start saying, well, I guess he shot his wad. <laughs> They'll start dropping off. <laughs> but again, I, I want to thank the group. And I really, I'd say, what is the most uh, unique or unusual bird you've seen in Maine? Well, the stellar sea eagle. Uh, talk about a famous bird. I did see him last year. I didn't bother to go look for him this year, but certainly the stellar sea eagle was big. Um, I've seen some other rarities in the state, but really everything is dwarfed by that one bird. So I was about to say, uh, again, thanks again to the friends. Um, you can't find this experience anywhere south of Maine. We're the only ones that have it in the whole, whole Eastern United States. And really, if you want to um, you know, have this experience, maybe Alaska with all of its uh, puffin related alcids, uh, that could be really good. But otherwise, you can't get it anywhere else. Maine's got it, so appreciate it. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much for this talk. And um, I believe Tori recorded it, so we can post this as well for folks to watch. If you love the talk and want to pass it along to your friends, um, definitely uh, Get, we'll get that link out to uh, to everyone as well. Tori, right. anything else? Um, just real quick, just saw a chat came in asking for you to repeat the name of your online uh, guide, your website there. Yes, mainbirdingtrail.com. And, uh, you know, all the coastal information is there, but all the inland information is there as well. So um, you'll find it pretty extensive because it took me years to put it together. <laughs> <laughs>